Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dick Deming. I'm medical director of Mercy One Cancer Center, and I'm the founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Welcome to our weekly cancer education series, brought to you in part from a grant from the Iowa Cancer Consortium. So welcome, everyone. And I got a good friend with me here in the <laughs> studio audience, uh, Sophia Ahmad. Hi, Dr. Sophia, Deming. welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. It's well, so good to see you. It's great to have you here. We should tell our audience that you and I have a little bit of background, that uh, Sophia is instrumental in helping us create the art, uh, the uh, music as therapy program mm -hmm. at the new Mercy One Richard Deming Cancer Center. Yes, yes. And uh, not only did uh, did she help create it, um, but she's also a wonderful musician. And um, Sophia grew up in Pennsylvania. Yes. And then got her undergrad degree in performance in piano, mm -hmm. and her graduate degree also in the Eastman School of Music in yes. Rochester, New York. That's right. Performing piano. So what was yes. like your senior, well, you probably don't get it, senior recital in college or your equivalent to a senior yes. recital in grad school? Like yes. what did you have to play? Like Rachmaninoff or um, oh, you yes. probably didn't get to do variations of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. No, okay. although my two-year-old son loves those variations okay. of Twinkle, Twinkle, okay. Little Star. Okay. And he, in fact, has a tiny little violin that he tries to play it on. But unfortunately, we didn't get to do that. So I played, oh my gosh, this feels like eons ago, but it was a dream. I played two very beautiful Beethoven sonatas. So one of them is his Opus 110, which is his sort of later style. Um, in that time period, he was going deaf. And so he was really exploring the capacities of the piano and the span and the range. So there's a lot where your hands are super far apart. He explored this musical technique called Beibang, which is actually, it creates this gasping sound on the instrument. And it's accomplished through the piano's double escapement mechanism. So on the piano, a hammer releases and then it um, releases quickly again. But if you depress it fast enough, it won't sound again. And that creates this <gasps> sound on the piano, which he, he mm. really pioneered in this sonata. So that's that one. I play an another Beethoven sonata, the Appassionata, which is a very famous exciting one and some Bach and some Chopin, I believe, and some Schumann and the whole nine yards. So Schoenberg. when you're doing like this, this senior recital, uh -huh. like get a graduate program and performance, do you, you do it with no sheet music, right? You've you do got, it memorized. You That's have correct. To memorize it all. That's correct. So not only playing all this, but you're doing it from memory. That's correct. Now, so it's it's interesting because it is it is very it's a very very difficult thing to do, and you see concert instrumentalists and pianists doing this all the time, um, and yet it's almost easier to play memorized than with the music because the music becomes a distraction when you're trying to hear a sound in your mind and then physically execute it in real time and space. And there are things that you want to do in a concert hall or in a performance space that are really, really important sometimes to not have the music there. So for example, if it's particularly reverberant, if it's very echoey, you may want to lay off the pedal and you may have to leave some more time in between rests or you know, moments of silence, right? So that the sound has a chance to clear. If it's particularly dry, you may be more exposed as an instrumentalist. Talk to pianists about how much they may not like that a little bit, right? Um, and then you may add a little bit more pedal, but it's this constant feedback system of what you're hearing and then what you're playing and then adjusting as, as needed. Yeah, but it has to take many, many hours for your fingers to know where to go. That's correct. Without and you actively, I mean, our brain is amazing. How can our brain actually get somebody to do yeah. a half hour piece of your fingers just almost moving without you thinking? I know, right? I know. Well, you're the physician, so I count on you for explaining okay. how that works okay. because I don't, but By I By the end of our hour, we will have <laughs> yes. cracked that nut, yes. I'm sure. But what I will say is that the most effective and efficient um, memorizers, if that's even a word, um, know that the music does not begin here, it begins up here. And some may say it begins in your heart too, but you really have to, when you go to memorize, say a Beethoven sonata, 
um, or a piece of music like that, you have to understand it at a 30,000 foot view. So you're looking at high level formal structure. I mean, there's four movements of the piece. The first movement is typically in what's called sonata form. So it, it kind of fo follows a storyline pattern, like a story, you have an exposition or an introduction and then a development and usually two thirds of the way through it, something really, really the dramatic appears, happens. The yes, the witch or the storm. Yeah. And then you have to have time to resolve it. Well, music follows typically Western music, um, follows a similar pattern where you start in a home key, everything seems to be going pretty well until a secondary key comes along or a secondary pattern and then everything goes awry. They develop it, they go into different key areas. There's a lot of clashing. The audience is like this and then eventually it resolves back to the home key. And then, um, so you're, you're kind of looking at it that way. And then you get lower and lower and to the more granular. And eventually, I mean, I feel, and I know a lot of other pianists in particular, because we have, you know, we have the most notes probably, <laughs> but <laughs> um, don't tell my husband who's a Do violinist. You, I, but um, oh, I didn't realize yeah. it's this competition. Oh, I had yeah. more notes than you oh, did. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I had more lines. Oh in yeah, this play for sure, than you did. for okay. sure. That's what. No. Yeah. Um, but the poor symbol guy. The poor symbol. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Well, it kind of gets back to why, like, why do you memorize in the first place? You memorize. I mean, the complexity of it is such that you do, it's it's sort of what I hear professional golfers do. I'm not a professional golfer, but you kind of get in the mindset of flow and in the moment, and you're really mm -hmm. visualizing where the ball is going mm -hmm. in the swing and not thinking of the mechanics of it. It's the same thing with a good performance. You have to hear the sound you want to create in your mind, and then you've trained physically and from a technical perspective to be able to execute that in real time and adjust as you need to. And if you try to go into the technical part of it, like, oh, I have to turn my thumb under, or I have to do this, it actually hurts time. you, yeah, yeah and, and, and such. So it's amazing how something that uh, technically challenging and difficult that those of us just listening can still appreciate what comes out without having to know what yes. goes into it. Yes, well, and that's the magic of good music making too. There are certain things that musicians know that will be compelling to listeners to feel like they're included in the performance experience. For example, research has shown that a steady beat helps people feel more connected to music and more you'll get responses like, oh, I like that piece better than something that's uneven, right? And that's because, you know, we have natural rhythms within our body mm -hmm. and, and natural cycles within our bodies too. Mm -hmm. And we as humans can really feel that. And so I think, um, you know, as I can speak for pianists, you know, we think a lot about rhythm, of course, but we think a lot about pulse and how that, um, can relate to the natural human pulse or mm -hmm. pulse you feel in nature or these sorts right. of things. And as you sort of alluded to, a nice natural pulse is healthier than atrial fibrillation. Right. Which coming through in music is like sporadic right. and right. dissonant and uh, right. yeah. And, and even not calming. Right. And even um, you know, there's some really interesting what we call new music or new compositions and particularly classical music where it almost sounds as if it's just completely awry but if you were really to put a beat to it you could find a center okay. of gravity so to speak you in a beat it's just a very beat to fill up glass exactly beat. it's just very it could be very it's syncopated hidden. or in his case very repetitive or um there's um a musical term called hemiola and i like to explain it to music students as hemiola <laughs> because that's where the beat falls where you don't expect oh. it to fall um or you know syncopation is another word for that which with a particular syllable to accent ex exactly which syllable to accent uh -huh. <laughs> so um we're going to talk about the therapeutic eff effect that yes. music can have um and and we're going to distinguish in our talk uh the concept of music therapy and music as therapy. Yes. And uh, I think most of us intuitively understand music as, as therapy. I mean, who doesn't use music to either, I mean, 
in 45 minutes, I'm going to be up in the spin room using music to to enhance a mood, to use a beat that is is being used kind of therapeutically, yes. intentionally yes. to help create a mood, a rhythm, a uh, an impulse to exercise yes. greater. Um, and who hasn't put on calming music before bed to try to help create mm -hmm. a mood of relaxation and calming? So I suspect from the very beginning of... So who do you music folks as ascribe the, the creator of music? Well, the creator of music, oh my gosh. Well, that's a good question. I don't so know probably, if that's There's been, probably a Greek or Roman there's, god yes. that, has, that bears the title. Yes. Of. Well, we do know, I mean, in terms of music use as therapy, I mean, that was alluded to as early as the time of Aristotle and probably, you know, way mm -hmm. before that. Um, there was something in the Baroque era that any music student will study um, called the Doctrine of the Affections. And this doctrine said, and they really believed it and prescribed to it, particularly in art and in music, that either um, visual or audio sounds could um, create these really, really um, uh, specific emotions, so to speak. So um, Bach, for example, was obviously a well-known composer in the Baroque era. He utilized the doctrine of the affections and um, for example, there may be certain figurations in music that like had a descending chromatic scale, for example, where it would move by half step down, and it was often thought to denote sorrow or sadness. Mm -hmm. You could have a leaping pattern that was meant to express joy. So even at that point, they were thinking about um, how music could be utilized to evoke certain emotions in people who were playing it, but then also people who were listening to it. Um, that also tied into the sorts of tuning that they used. They had um, something called well-tempered tuning. So um, you may have heard of Bach's well-tempered clavier. It's a set of 48 pieces he composed for piano in particular um, modes or in particular keys because they tune them differently to create different feelings or different mm. emotions. That they thought would would bring out emotions. Correct. Yeah. And then you saw that. Is anybody going to Broadway knows there's something. I mean, you, you, a song like, um, you know, Les Miserables, I Dreamed a Dream, and there's something about, even if you didn't know the words right. and the stories, that, that the, somebody gets to sing that brings tears to your yes. eyes. Just the... the I don't know if it's mm -hmm. the key it's in, if yes. it's the note it's in, or if it's minor or major, yes. or playing with that, that that almost makes you well up because yes. it touches you somewhere. There are certain musical intervals or patterns or keys or figurations that can be used to create um, what have typically been associated with certain emotions or feelings. And so that for sure is real. Um, going back to the keys, I mean, what was sort of established in the Baroque era, continued through the classical era with Beethoven. So he in particular used certain keys, E flat major, he used as a very heroic key. So he has this Emperor Concerto, which is um, on Sirius XM's um, classical channel, if anybody listens to that. Um, my husband and I listened to their concerto countdown and their number one concerto was the Beethoven Emperor Concerto in E flat major. And so we we actually were listening in different cars and called each other and we're like, can you believe it? You know, um, but but it's a very heroic key, like his heroic. Er Not quite the so same many. as how about them Yankees? Yeah, <laughs> it's a little different, but you have to follow what excites you, right? Right. Um, uh, and so, and that even continues now. I mean, we oftentimes associate the key of F major with a pastoral theme. So um, it has a B flat in it, which is um, a preferred, flats are preferred for wind instruments. So you hear, you know, you can think of flutes and pastoral scenes and whatnot. And so there are these sort of tropes in music that have followed us for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years that have helped people connect to sound and emotion and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, what's particularly interesting too in the um, late 
uh, well, 1800s, so late 18th century, early 19th century, um, is that composers became more emboldened with how they talked about the powers of music and what they could do. So I kid you not, you asked about one of my, um, you know, some of my recitals. Well, at Eastman School of Music, I did a lecture recital on Schumann, a romantic composer. He wrote a piece called Waldsehen and called uh, Forest Scenes. And um, they really believed, um, and this was championed by poets and sort of taken up by musicians, that when words trailed off, it would actually turn into music. I mean, there are treatises and um, poems and books written about this. Um, they really believed in the power of music to transform the human experience. Um, I, I pulled this quote from WC that just came up on my social media feed this weekend that I thought was so interesting. And he says, so WC was a French impressionistic composer, but music, don't you know, is a dream from which the veils have been lifted. It's not even the expression of a feeling, it's the feeling itself. So these were the sorts of things that, you know, composers really felt and believed as they created these pieces and wanted performers and listeners alike to really feel that. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> over time, we know <clears throat> we participated in a project with the Civic Music Association and the <clears throat> Brooklyn Writer uh, String Quartet. Yes performing variations of a piece that was written with the idea of healing in yes. mind. Yes, yes. And uh, talk a little bit more about that piece and the history of how that piece was either written or promoted to be healing. And what what did it have the power to heal? Sure. Did it have the power to heal um, uh, the blues, I mean a depression? Did it have the power to heal syphilis? Sure. Did it have the power to heal tuberculosis? Yes, yes. So we um, were very fortunate to be approached by Civic Music Association that was um, collaborating with several individuals and organizations in the community. So Mercy One, Richard Deming Cancer Center, John Sutter Cancer Center came together for this project, as well as musicians and um, cancer survivors to, to explore music and to explore the healing modes of music with, as Dr. Deming said, this professional, wonderful string quartet, the Brooklyn Writers String Quartet. So that event actually opened with a really interesting panel discussion, which actually you could um, Google and rewatch that. It's it's really worth it. It's very very compelling, um, in which we talked about the the healing that can come from music, um, and I love the way Dr. Deming that you talk about it, where we we think about what exactly it means to heal through music, and you say always, you know, we're not killing cancer cells through music, but we're improving our quality of life, we're improving our well-being, we're lifting our mood, we're lifting our spirits, or we're exploring emotions, or we're exploring places that take us back to moments that are worth revisiting, or take us back to places that um, are maybe not worth experiencing again. They can, if you've ever had that experience where you've listened to a song and you've been brought back to a place in your life. Um, I was in a, where was I? I was in a store and I heard a U2 song called Lemon that I listened to in college and I felt like I was in college again, right? It can have those memory evoking um, qualities as well. So the Brooklyn Writers on um, that particular program were playing a Beethoven string quartet and um, just bringing it back to, to Beethoven, who um, I'll just note is my, happens to be my favorite composer. Um, apologies to any other um, people out there who may have other opinions. But he really, it, he, he's such an interesting person because he wasn't a perfect composer. If you look at his early works, some of them were really great, like for Elise is probably a really good example of his an early work that was great, but some of them weren't. I mean, he was figuring things out. Um, and then when he um, discovered he was becoming deaf, he wrote a letter, a famous letter called the Heiligenstadt Testament, in which he sort of came to terms with this um, deafness. And he said, I need to really, really focus on not performing anymore, not teaching anymore, but really only on composition. And do you remember earlier when we were talking about how the music begins in your mind? Um, something I didn't really say is that like, it, 
if if you're really trying to memorize a piece, um, especially on the piano, you know that you've really memorized it if you can kind of, if you can close your eyes and hear the music in your mind and almost imagine yourself actually executing the piece in real time. And then what's really remarkable is you can get to the point where you can hear yourself play it and adjust it. You can think, oh, I don't want to do it like that. I want to do it like this. And you can actually practice in your mind. There's, there's not a document I found that really attests to this, but I have a feeling that that's the same mind muscle that Beethoven used as he was writing mm -hmm. his later quartets, like the one that the Brooklyn writers played. And then as he's writing, as he's deaf, is he, uh, he's hearing in his mind as he puts notations on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. he, I mean, he's, he, yep. he definitely knows music because yes. he's not one of these who just picks up guitar and plays things without right. reading music. Right. And by the time you're deaf, you, you know what that sounds like right. if you make a, a quarter note on this place in the grid. Right, <laughs> right. He's getting to the point where he can really hear the music in his mind. So also I should say in music, um, you say, you know, you recognize this, the real magic of music again, is to make it sound very effortless for the audience. Um, and yet it's highly, highly structured and highly organized. And also typically classical music follows, I would say 80% to 90% of Western music follows in general what we call a one five one pattern. So remember I was talking about the home key and then moving far away to a place, an unknown sonic land, and then moving back to this home area. That's a big formal structure that most every classical piece of music uses. Um, every Most every jazz piece uses, most every, like definitely every single rock piece okay. uses, um, which helps to provide a framework that you can hear things in your mind. So it wasn't so much as a guess for him, like, where do I go next? Mm. It's like, he's like, okay, I've got to get back to this point. I can do this like four or five different ways. Which way am I going to do it? And he probably manipulated it in his mind. Back to the um, Brooklyn writer and the Beethoven piece. So there's some history with this piece that was either written intentionally for healing or after being heard was understood as being healing. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that piece got associated with healing? I cannot remember the particulars of that, of the quartet that they played, so I apologize. But what I can say is that in, in music, um, and actually this sort of ties into another collaboration we had with Civic Music, um, in, in composer's research and in musicologist research, there have been certain musical gestures that have been correlated with uh, reduced stress. So perhaps reduced heart rate. For example, if the tempo or speed of a piece comes down, it has been correlated with a reduced heart rate or um, reduced stress or reduced anxiety. And so there may have been some elements of that that could have been mm -hmm. described as healing as well. And then another piece that's uh, associated with healing is the musical blessing. Yes. So uh, earlier this year, we had the world premiere uh, of a musical blessing uh, done by the Bellin Quartet. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit more about the composer yes. and the writing of that piece and then some of the musical um, techniques yes. that, that were used to bring out the healing effect of the music. Absolutely, yeah. So this was such a special project that you and I worked on together. Um, and we have we had engaged um, a composer named Nolan Gasser, who is the chief musicologist with Pandora Radio. And he came on our radar because he had done a similar commission for Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And so um, through a very informal Google search, we came across him and reached out to him and said, hey, we are launching this new Mercy One Richard Deming Cancer Center in Des Moines. And, um, you know, it's really a tribute to the vision that you have set for that cancer center, Dr. Deming, because 
if you're not familiar with it, the Mercy One Richard Deming Cancer Center has this really, really beautiful element of compassionate care. And in that has this integrative medicine program of which the music as therapy program is a part of. And so we were helping him understand what we were trying to accomplish with this patient-centered, multidisciplinary approach to care where um, the patient is surrounded by care in a comforting, compassionate environment. And how can we depict that in a way that honors this um, new addition that will help save thousands and thousands of lives in Iowa? And also, how can we use it in a way that our patients can participate with it in an ongoing, in an ongoing way? So um, Dr. Deming, you and I met with Nolan over the phone and um, talked a little bit about some of the things we hope to see in the piece. Um, you had shared with him a book that was an inspiration to you called To Bless the Space Between Us by John O'Donohue. Um, and that was the impetus for the title of the piece, A Musical Blessing. Um, we had shared with him about the Music as Therapy program and how it was our hope to have a, a portion of the piece. We called it like the Hey Jude portion, um, right? The <laughs> I'm sure he appreciated that. But we, um, it was a part where we wanted people non-musicians and musicians alike to feel like they could participate in it. You don't have to have any musical background to do it. You don't even have to have an instrument. You just have to have a willing heart. <laughs> um, and, and so this is a portion of the piece that um, is all in C major. If you have a piano or a mallet instrument, you cannot play a wrong note because it's all the white keys. Um, and it's intended to be um, participatory. And we'll maybe get into this in a little bit. Um, in music therapy, there are four sort of elements to, um, to music therapy. And one of them is actually participating in a piece. Another element is improvising. And so that sort of touched on both of those. So we had um, the preview world premiere for the donors of the uh, Richard Deming Cancer Center in April. And then we had the public world premiere and invited our cancer patients there and their families um, at the um, Bell and Quartet inaugural concert this year in May um, at the Temple for Performing Arts, which is a really, really special, special moment. Yes, as people, and one of the things that um, I didn't realize till I was in the room sitting just uh, three feet from these four musicians performing, and, and they're sitting in a square very close to each other, and there's two violins, a viola and a cello. Yes. And um, obviously the, the sound comes from vibration of strings, but when you're actually sitting within a couple feet of these four stringed instruments, you're not only hearing it, you're mm -hmm. feeling the vibrations of mm -hmm. the strings. Yes. And, and uh, so the four are performing. There's not a conductor. The four are looking at each other, interacting with each other, a few nods and sort of mm -hmm. ways of, you know, how long you're going to pause, when you're going to. But uh, the thing that I remember the most sitting that close was sensing, feeling right. within my body the actual vibration mm -hmm. of the strings, in addition to the elements mm -hmm. of, the, of the sound that yeah. was being created. There's really nothing like a live performance. Um, it feels different. You're engaging more senses, right? I mean, that additional sense of feeling that almost like a touch. Um, and you have the element of surprise. You know, mm -hmm. you can build off of the energy in the room. The audience is, in essence, an active participant in the piece, too, because the musicians feel that. And, you know, with a room full of people, the sound also changes and the feedback system changes for the quartet as well. Um, I don't know if you recall, they were rehearsing prior and you and I were there and they asked me to listen for balance. Um, and I gave them my feedback and at the same time reminded them that it's going to change when people are in the room too, because they sort of, you know, people absorb the sound as well. Um, the piece, you had asked a little bit about the piece and um, the forum and sort mm -hmm. of what it explores. So. The, the piece is not necessarily what's called programmatic in music, meaning that every single element represents something. There were composers who really did that. There's a um, composer, Berlioz, who composes 
famous symphony fantastique that had um, this ID fix that was, you know, perpetuated throughout the piece and every single musical passage depicted something. It's not that formulaic. In general, it explores elements of a cancer patient's journey. It explores the joyfulness in peaks. It, it, it explores sadness. And eventually, it settles in a place of hope and perhaps acceptance. And so um, he does this formally by exploring what's known as a rondo form in music, which is basically a contrasting form. So you might think of like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, a little something new, you know, a little something else new, and then back to that pattern again. So like a A, B, A, B, A, C, D, C, A, B, A sort of pattern or something like that. Um, but it's, it's about 10 or 11 minutes long. Um, if you actually go to the Mercy One uh, Retro Deming Cancer Center website, which is at mercyone.org slash rdcc. Um, you can listen to a professional recording of it, and you can also read really, really interesting program notes that were written by the composer himself um, intended for that purpose. Right, and in, in speaking with the composer before he composed it, we talked about the, the cancer journey and the ups and downs that happens. I mean, everyone's journey is different, but it often starts with shock and surprise. Mm -hmm. You have cancer and it uh, assembles a team. It proceeds with hope and optimism, but there's usually some hiccups along the way and some bumps along the road and uh, some foreboding as one wonders, am I gonna make it, am I gonna die? Then uh, there's joy, there's acceptance, mm -hmm. and there's you know this resolution that mm -hmm. comes. And um, I thought he did a wonderful job of you know uh, creating music that evokes those various mm -hmm. emotions, and more than just emotions, they're kind of like uh, meanings and um, um, ideas, mm -hmm. as, uh, ph philosophical ideas as much as they are emotions. Mm -hmm. I think I can hear portions of it in my mind as you're talking about it. And I think about um, the first violin in the quartet has these figurations that almost sound like questions um, that, you know, when you ask a question, typically your voice goes up. Mm -hmm and the violin does that and then it sort of half resolves and then it goes up again and sort of half resolves and i think about that too with um you know uncertainty perhaps mm -hmm. in the journey or questioning why is this happening now to me at this time you know how is this going to feel um there's some really complex emotions and experiences that music can explore that, um, you know, there's that famous quote that Hans Christian Andersen, when, when words fail, music speaks, right? Um, and you can really sense that, I think, in this musical blessing piece. Well, let's talk a little bit about the music as therapy uh, programming that, that's already happened and what's planned yes. to happen. Um, so I know that you already had a gig with some ukulele players. Yes, yes. So so, so that was one of the first uh, yes. music as therapy. So um, Sophia is a is a professional musician, but she's not a music therapist. That's correct. Which is someone who is trained in counseling, basically psychotherapy, utilizing music along with professional counseling skills and one doesn't have to be a music therapist to participate in music as therapy mm -hmm. so before we talk about music therapy sure let's talk about music as therapy and sure. maybe just start by one of the the little uh, programs you put together yes. for the cancer center yeah. as, as music as therapy yes so um and when dr deming and kylie cooper the director of integrative medicine uh approached uh me and um, my organization about this, we, um, I wanted to really understand what we were trying to accomplish and what we were trying to do. And so we came up with a content document that helped understand what we're sort of rooting this in and what the programs would look like. And so at the heart, um, overarching the music, music as therapy programming at the Deming Cancer Center includes 
one-on-one -on -one music therapy counseling for patients at the Deming Cancer Center. It includes monthly programming, which we'll talk about in a moment here, and then it includes quarterly community-based programming in which we, as a group, um, go out into the community and experience music together. So what Dr. Deming was alluding to um, was a group ukulele class. It was our first monthly drop-in class. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, you know, as we're planning the music as therapy programming, we are including a music therapist to attend some of the classes and actually to plan some of the classes. And so, um, as Dr. Deming said, I'm not a music therapist, but I have enough music knowledge and we're engaging music therapists um, to interact with these. So the first class we had um, a woman named Natalie Steenson who is a ukulele player and specializes in group ukulele instruction and is just a wonderful all around educator. And she came with a rolling cart of ukuleles and um, brought them, we had several um, patients there and we myself included got trained on how to play this wasn't intended to be you know related necessarily to the cancer experience but as a way to explore trying something new as a way to maybe take the mind off of treatments um, as a way to stretch the boundaries of what we can do um, we had individuals there that you know, are experiencing side effects from their treatment, um, perhaps fatigue or um, immobility in some places too. And so it was really inspiring to be able to see them in the moment, try this and for us to be able to adapt to enable them to still have an enjoyable experience. We all played classics such as um, Shoe Fly Shoe together, um, you know, uh, Baba Black Sheep, if you've heard of that's another good one. Really, some really good. So they accomplished a lot in I'm just an hour. Bubbles. We didn't do tiny <laughs> bubbles, unfortunately. Um, but we had, and now I'm trying to remember some, we got to some really interesting, more complicated songs too. But as so I mentioned. So ukulele is four strings. Four strings. And does, does it have frets? It does. So you uh, can, you, you, yeah. that helps you. Yes. To, learn where to put your fingers yeah well it has or... it has um it came with and i'm not i'm not a ukulele expert okay um but it has positions where you can um you know and she put stickers on there oh, where you could great. you know yeah. figure out what to Remember. do yeah even i i was like thinking through it it's like okay i gotta concentrate now <laughs> but it was it was really really nice and in fact the feedback we got after the class was just that that um people felt that they could take their mind off of um, treatment and think about mm -hmm. something else just for When you talk about hour. flow, I mean, anything where you just requires, that requires your attention, mm -hmm. takes your mind off of regrets of yesterday and worries about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And the more that we're here today, and that can be done by creating art, creating music, but there's the, the act of creating something that requires your attention mm -hmm. is therapeutic. Yes. But then there is this group thing, yes. which is, you know, there's theories that even marching together in mm -hmm. time, doing something together as a group in time has yes. the therapeutic benefit. Yes. And then, of course, there's the auditory mm -hmm. component of the music that you're creating. Yes, yes, for sure. And it's just remarkable to be able to engage in that in that way, too. I mean, you're right that there is something that's really special about that group experience. Um, and in fact, somebody asked if we were going to be doing that every month, um, to which I thought, wow, well, that's a good vote of confidence. But, um, you know, I don't I don't know that we can, but we'll for sure do those um, more often as well. What is the next drop in? The next drop in is coming up a week from um, Monday. So what's it? Today's Wednesday, right? Right. Today's Wednesday. Okay. So this coming Monday is the, um, 11th. Is an, the 11th and okay, July, July 11th, 11th. And that's the next drop in. And we have for this drop in a certified music therapist who's coming in. Her name. Oh, go ahead. No, what Her, time? On it, it is Monday, so, July 11th. Mon, so all of these programs, the monthly drop ins are the second Monday of the month at 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. at the Mercy One West Des Moines Medical Center. 
in the garden room downstairs. So, okay. um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so that's 12485 Cl uh, University Avenue, Clive. Yep, it's right those, here in Clive. It's, it's just uh, um, the Mercy Cancer Center office in Clive. Yep. And that's where the drop-in music yep. will be. And, and people can drop in. You don't mm -hmm. have to sign up ahead of time. Yeah. So sorry about that. So that's no, uh, don't next apologize. Monday. And, yep. and what are we going to do? Yeah, so we are going to be led in a session with um, a music therapist from West Music. Her name is Maddie. And she is going to be playing several pieces of music and several songs. And um, we're going to be doing uh, some... What sort of an instrument? Um, that I believe she's actually playing it. She might be playing it live or singing it live and she'll have percussion in instruments, okay. but she may be playing it pre-recorded. but we're gonna do some lyric exploration oh, okay. and listen um, to the lyrics of the song and then participants will create their own personal mantra about um, healing or an experience. And then we'll put those personal mantras together and create a song. And then we'll actually play the song together with some percussion instruments. Awesome. So we're going to do that all in an hour. Yeah. <laughs> so so that, yeah, the focus, as, as you pointed out, the, the music itself, but the lyrics. I mean, some songs we remember because of the lyrics. You know? That's right. I've That's looked right. At life from both sides now. That's you know, right. Climb yes. every mountain. Yes, I mean, for where, sure. Where the, where the lyrics kind of bring you in and mm -hmm. make you think. Absolutely, absolutely. There's some real, real, I think, powerful things that can happen with that. Mm -hmm. So we're excited about that. Now in August, we're in for a real treat because, and the August one is the only one that will be actually held in the county conference room, which is just, oh gosh, 50 feet away maybe from the garden room in the same location um, at the West Des Moines Medical Center for the August meeting. And we will be joined by Nolan Gasser, who is the composer of A Musical Blessing. He'll be joining us via Zoom from California and walking us through the Musical Blessing piece and talking about it. We'll listen to the piece and then we will have a music therapist there on site to walk us through the portion of the piece that we can actually participate in. So we'll have instruments there, we'll participate in that and explore that piece in that way, which will be really exciting. Great, great. And I just realized, I wanna correct something. I, I misunderstood where the, the event's gonna be on 7 Live. It's not the Mercy Cancer Center, Clive, it's the Mercy Hospital. Yes. So it's, it's so the address I gave is not correct. So it's at the Mercy <laughs> Hospital mm -hmm. that has a beautiful room with waterfall and a piano. Yes. Yes. So she yes. doesn't have to bring a keyboard. Yeah. Yes, the beautiful piano. So that's at the Mercy Hospital, <laughs> which is technically in West Des Moines, mm -hmm. just on the south side of the University. Yes. And um, yes. 59th and in uh, West Des Moines. And we thought we would try that venue because it for a, for a few reasons. When you come in, as Dr. Deming said, you actually do walk by this beautiful grand waterfall that visually is very, very um, peaceful, but you also have the sound quality of the water trickling down and hitting the rocks and splashing the water that we felt sets a really nice tone for this. Um, and then you have the grand piano there in the foyer, and then um, we're sort of set in a, in a private area as well, which we just found was really nice. And we actually heard from one of the participants that she appreciated for that day coming to a place that was maybe not where she was receiving treatment. So oh. that was that was interesting feedback. Great parking, easy parking, and very e easy access. If you do come, you will need to bring a photo ID, and um, we'll wear masks throughout. And um, we have we would have masks on site there. And if you, as Dr. Deming said, you can drop in. Um, however, if you want to register in advance, it just helps our um, presenters plan a little bit more. So you would just want to email Brittany B R I T T. A N Y Brittany at mobile music lessons.com. So mobile as in a mobile phone, M O B I L E music lessons.com, and she'll get you registered and signed up. So, and mobile music is Sophia's company, and, mm -hmm. and 
invite you to tell us more about that company. And Sophia also is a vice president of philanthropy at Wesley Light. Yes, yes. So, and that's a, a new position for her. Yes. So, uh, she's been involved with uh, fundraising for many years and uh, um, Many music organizations need to do fundraising. Yes, <laughs> in order to yes, yes, they do. Yes. Well, it feels, um, and thank you for those kind words, Dr. Deming. I mean, it feels very full circle to do this. So I was um, full time at Mercy One just up until Friday and just treasured my time there so much. Um, moving to Wesley Life and this. Um, new, they're creating a new foundation that I have the privilege of leading. Seemed like a natural progression into, you know, a health and wellness space from Mercy One. And of course, with my music background, to be able to be a part of this is such a privilege in sort of bringing the two together um, to, to really see your vision through this music as therapy program and how it will help um, cancer patients and really help unite our community, I think, through music. Um, there's a, been a lot of research over the centuries on music as therapy, and I recently was uh, uh, reading some um, studies that are being uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health, and they are actually uh, have as one of their, I guess how you would call her a champion, a musician, Renee Fleming, oh, who sure. is a opera singer, but has long recognized this this therapeutic effect that a music can have. So they're actually looking at uh, clinical trials using music to help with pain management, mm -hmm. to help with certain neurologic disorders, mm -hmm. including dementia. I mean, there's lots of anecdotal information of individuals who aren't very communicative because of dementia, but then you play a particular song, and the next thing you know, they haven't spoken for weeks, but they mm -hmm. might start singing along to the song. Mm -hmm. And uh, also looking at, in cancer care, the use of music, not necessarily the theory that a certain note will kill a cancer cell, but the use of music to reduce stress and reduction of stress can actually have effects on how the body's immune system may play a better role mm. in regulating cancer. Interesting. So, so it's not beyond the possibility mm -hmm. that music could have a result in killing cancer cells through stress reduction, enhancement of the immune system, and then the immune system's effect mm -hmm on cancer. But even if it doesn't end up killing a cancer cell, you know, taking care of patients with cancer is about overall right. quality of life. Right. And how can music help with stress reduction, pain management, relaxation, mm -hmm. uh, all of those elements of healing right. that have a positive effect on the way we feel. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. I think also you know, it's important to mention too, you hear sometimes about the positive benefits of playing an instrument, right? That um, it may help improve connections between the hemispheres of the brain and help improve executive functions and whatnot. Some of the things that we're talking about here with, um, you know, reduction in stress and whatnot, the studies at least that I have seen um, are not necessarily by playing an instrument, like you can play an instrument as part of music therapy, right? Um, we talk about that with um, the recreation aspect of music therapy, but there's also the receptive aspect of music therapy, which is just listening and experiencing the music, and these healing elements have been correlated or associated with even that receptive portion, um, which is really fantastic as well. Yes, reducing blood pressure, um, even studies looking at um, blood tests of immune function or the stress hormones, mm -hmm. you know, and how we can change physiologically based on blood tests and measurements of our physiology by listening to music. Mm -hmm. It's just remarkable. It's remarkable. Um, 
Let's talk a little bit about music therapy because, sure. as you mentioned, we're also you're not a music therapist; you're a musician, um, and uh, we can gain a lot of healing from just participating. But talk a bit about the profession of a music therapist yes. and how that's different from music as therapy. Sure, sure. So we are. I'll just say this too, and. In- the Des Moines, Central Iowa era, where, and in Iowa, we are very fortunate to have certified music therapists here. Um, we, through our program, have engaged West Music that has a nice roster of music therapists who have some flexibility that can come and again do one-on-one therapy sessions with our cancer patients at the cancer center who can participate and lead these classes and who we actually can engage to have on site when a professional musician who may not be a music therapist is leading a class that may conjure up emotions that may require a music therapist to be there to help counsel an individual. And so um, a music therapist, as you alluded to earlier, goes through a set of uh, trainings and certifications to become a certified music therapist. And so um, they oftentimes have a an appreciation, an appreciation for music. They oftentimes have had professional music training, um, and then they have a desire to serve others or to give back or to work in a health and wellness area or field, and they go through programs and certifications to become a music uh, therapist. So um, there are several of these programs throughout the country, and um, we're fortunate to have several of them here in Iowa who have gone through that training in particular. And so that, that interaction um, between you know our musicians, myself um, and Brittany, our mu- mobile music lessons managing director, as the administrators of this, and the musical therapists, it, that's very very important, so that the patient and the participant has a very well rounded experience when they come in, and it feels effortless for them, and it feels like they've you know gained something or have had a positive experience afterwards. So we're going to bring it to a close, and um, what we're going to do is we're each going to share some music. We're not we're not necessarily performing. We'll oh, just okay. say what it is. Okay. So uh, what would you, you 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 want to get pumped up? You just uh, uh, something that will get you feeling um, energetic and happy. What's on your plate? Oh gosh. Well, and I I do not just listen to classical music. I'll just say that. So, um I oh gosh, I listen to I listen to a, a huge array of music, but um I really like um Kaigo, if you've ever heard of him. He's a Norwegian DJ and I I would recommend a lot of his music for that. Okay. I believe he's Norwegian, but yeah. And okay. producer. He's actually classically trained though. Okay. So. Yeah. How about you? So um, I, you can't go wrong with Tina Turner. I, yeah, I, I would say. I totally yeah, agree. Yeah, Tina Turner. Yeah. Do you remember? You're the best. We, You're simply the best. Yes, that's You're right. You're better than all the rest. Yeah. You're better than yes. anyone. Wait, sorry. We had we had asked Nolan to consider incorporating some Tina, Tina Turner, Turner. Okay. elements in a musical <laughs> blessing. Unfortunately, we did not see those um, in the piece, which, you know, who knows, maybe in another iteration. but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that, that gets me going. And so you can listen to my entire playlist by coming and joining, joining me for spin class. I would love that. Okay. I would we'll love do, that. We'll do yeah. that. Could I ask you about a piece? Sure. Is there a, a piece of music that brings a, a tear to your eye when you hear it or moves you? Sure. I would say um, one that is uh, Bring Him Home mm. from Les Miserables. Mm-hmm. And a part of it is the lyrics, and part of it is the story, and then part of it is uh, a setting where I heard it um, mm. at a at a celebration of life of a, of a young man who had died. And mm. in this, the song is the older man is the, the young man is wounded, and mm. uh, he basically is hoping and praying that he is not dead and mm-hmm. that he will bring him home safely and mm-hmm. that he would give his life to make that happen oh. so it's uh, uh, in, in the context of the show you know right. where you you know the characters but even in just the song itself is mm-hmm. just 
an amazing song. Yes, so it that, really yeah, is. You can't listen to that song. No. I can't listen no. to that song without yeah. tears. Yeah. Yeah. For me, thank you for sharing that. It's um, the last movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony when it finally, when the chorus finally sings um, with full volume and there's sort of a descending bass line right before it. Is and that it's the just, Ode to Joy? Yes, the, or, the famous Ode to uh -huh. Joy movement of Beethoven's Ninth uh -huh. Symphony. And if you haven't had the opportunity to hear it in person live, I highly, highly recommend going. The Des Moines Symphony plays it every few years live and it's just the most tremendous thing you could mm. maybe experience in, in life, I think. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks everyone for joining us this evening at the Cancer Education Series. If you know someone that you think might enjoy listening to this, it will appear tomorrow uh, on demand at the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel and at the Mercy Cancer Center website where you can watch it uh, over and over again. <laughs> and I hope you'll come and join us again next week. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you, Sophia. It's my pleasure. Thanks Thanks for everybody. Me. Good night. Bye.